You need this knife. Or maybe you need this one in your kitchen. And you definitely need one of these. And, and probably one of these ones too. I like to have one of these for sure. But wait, how many kitchen knives do you actually need? And does anybody need that block of like 17 knives that everybody seems to get for their wedding? Well, probably not. But let's talk a little bit about kitchen knives, which ones you need, and how many. Japanese knives and kitchen knives in general are super fun. The Japanese ones are wicked sharp and crazy collectible because there's so many different cool styles and makers and designs and shapes. But it can be intimidating if you're getting into the world of kitchen knives, knowing which one you should buy first and how many you should have in your collection. I probably have more than I need in my collection. You know, some people say you only need one knife. Some people say, like me, you probably need one more knife. When it comes down to it, you probably need about three good kitchen knives to start. So I'm gonna run you through every single shape of knife, starting with the ones that are essential, and then maybe build you a couple of sets so you can get some ideas of uh, where to start with your collection, or if you've already got one or two knives, where you wanna go next. So the best place to start a kitchen knife collection is with the most used knife, and that's gonna be a chef's knife. This is a Guto, specifically a 210 millimeter Guto. In English, it's about an eight inch chef's knife. This is a really versatile blade that uh, most people can use for pretty much any job in their kitchen. Let me show you. Say I wanna dice up an onion. Blade's long enough that I can get a really nice clean cut through the onion. I can use the heel of the knife to uh, trim up any little bits like the root end and the tip. It's got a nice sharp tip so I can get in, do a little horizontal cut for all you internet commenters out there. Get my nice precise cuts in here like so and then cut cleanly across it and have nice diced onion. 210 millimeters, it's a great size. Very, very versatile. I even like to use a longer 240 millimeter Guto, which is closer to 10 inches. And that's my go-to knife in my home kitchen. I'm also a tall guy, I got big hands, and so that's a practical size for me. Not everybody's comfortable with a knife this big. My spouse, many of my friends, most of my family, they prefer to use something a little smaller. This is called a Santoku, and they tend to come in 165 millimeter or around 185 millimeter. That's like roughly six or seven inches, I think, but it's a really comfortable size for people that aren't as comfortable with a big honking knife. Check it out, it does the exact same thing. It's got a nice point, so you can do your scoring cuts, your horizontal and your vertical cuts on Mr. Onion here, uh, and the blade is still long enough that you can cut across the onion in nice, long, sliding cuts. You're not limited by the size of the knife, and it does a fantastic job. Where this guy is gonna fall a little short, literally, is getting into big stuff. Say you need to cut apart a big squash, or carve a turkey, or a roast. This guy's gonna be a little short, and you're gonna find it struggles in big, dense vegetables, and it saws back and forth, and kind of shreds meat. So if you do cook a lot of meat, you might wanna go for something a little bigger. At the end of the day, the knife you're gonna use most is the knife that you like and the knife that you're comfortable with. If you are comfortable with this size of the knife, get this size of knife, you know? Don't force yourself to use something different. If you wanna be a little adventurous and you wanna push your boundaries a little bit and try something different, go a little bigger. So these bigger guys are gonna handle probably 80% of the jobs you do on average in your home kitchen, but there are jobs you're gonna need something smaller for. Think of this guy as your chef, Think of these little guys as your sous chef. These are petty knives. Uh, or as we might call them in the West, paring knives or utility knives. They come in a few different sizes. Uh, the most common, I would say, is kind of middle of the road, 135 millimeters. Uh, this guy is great for a variety of tasks, both doing stuff in your hands, you know, uh, taking the eyes out of potatoes, trimming the tops off of strawberries, but you can also use them on a cutting board. Slice up this little mushroom here. Uh, the knife is small, so I don't have a lot of knuckle clearance, but if I work from a little higher up, it works just great. I often use a knife about this size in the morning. Uh, you know, I'm making, making breakfast, making lunch for the family before work. Uh, I'll often have a stainless knife going, so that if I have to rush out the door, I can just leave it on the cutting board. It's not a big knife sitting on the counter, and it's not gonna rust while I'm at work. If you're a bit of a taller, bigger person like me with big hands, you might wanna go even larger with your knife. This is 150 millimeters because when you hold uh, a knife like this and work in your hand, you're gonna be choking up on the blade and making that knife a lot smaller. And so I could pretty comfortably do a lot of jobs in my hand with a knife this big. When you get down to the cutting board, you get a bit of an advantage from that extra length. But if you don't have big hands, you might wanna go even smaller. This is a 90 millimeter. This guy's really, really great for the in-hand work. 
I got family in BC and the one ant loves to peel potatoes with a knife. And so if you like to do that kind of work, this is gonna be a great knife for you. It's gonna struggle a little more on the cutting board. You're more likely to run your knuckles into that board. So think about how you use a smaller knife and choose based on that. If you are starting your kitchen knife collection, these are the two you should get. Something larger like a Gyuto or Santoku and something smaller like a petty knife. Together, you can do 95, 99% of the jobs in your home kitchen with these two knives. That said, three is the magic number, and at Knifeware, you get 10% off when you're buying three or more knives at the same time. In my home kitchen, I find three kind of different lengths or sizes to be the most versatile without going over the top. So when it comes down to it, my bare bones essential knife kit is gonna look a little bit something like this. Something pretty short, like, for example, a 135 Petty. Something medium-sized, 210 millimeter Guto is a great way to go. And then something long. In this case, I've got a Sujihiki. This is a long meat slicing blade. The longer blade allows you to slice through uh, cooked and raw meat without having to saw and hack back and forth and damage it or spill all the juices in that delicious roast that you made. I also find this guy pretty good for bread. It might struggle with the crust of a a hard sourdough, but it's really going to work well uh, if you're slicing any kind of softer bread. Those three, short, medium, and long, are going to be great for most home cooks. And you can sub in knives you like. You can go with a shorter petty if you wanted to. You could swap out the Guto for a Santoku. Uh, you could switch the Sujihiki for a bread knife. Choose stuff that's going to suit the way you like to cook, uh, the kind of food you like to cook, and what you're most comfortable with at home. But once you get those, you might want to continue building your collection. Uh, you might get into different types of cooking and need different types of knives for those applications. I'm going to go through every single shape of Japanese kitchen knife, explain its purposes, and why you might want one. You might not need every single knife I'm going to talk about here, unless you're me, in which case you probably need two of everything, but you might want to add a few to your collection as you go. Let's start with the basics. I mentioned earlier a bread knife. You know, these guys are serrated, and so they're gonna be able to get through that crust of that beautiful sourdough that you've learned to bake, or the artisanal loaf that you buy down the street. Uh, some people will swap this out for the sujihiki because they eat more bread than they do roasts. Totally reasonable. Uh, I have that in addition to the rest of my collection at home. Another shape that's super popular is a nakiri. This looks a bit like a cleaver, but it's actually a Japanese vegetable knife. Most of the blades we've talked about so far have some sort of curve to the edge, and that's really good for uh, nice kind of sliding, rocking cuts like so. It's really great when you're mincing herbs uh, and, and kind of fast chopping stuff, but sometimes you go through, you cut a pepper, and you've got a whole bunch of pieces that are still stuck together. You gotta pull them apart before you put them in your stir fry. That's not ideal. So if you are chopping a lot of veggies, or you just like to eat a lot of vegetables, a flatter edge can be better for that. Because of the flat edge of the nakiri, you're gonna use more of a sliding cut with it, but you get a really, really clean cut when it comes down to the cutting board. See, when I slice through this pepper, I don't really have to rock the knife at all. I just slide it forward, and all those pieces are really cleanly separated. Again, I don't have to go back and pull them apart at all. So if you're doing a ton of vegetable prep, a nakiri is gonna be a great choice. It also fits in really nicely between a petty knife and a gyuto. Kind of fills in a bit of a gap there. And so that could be a great complement to the set that you built. So remember that big knife set of 17 knives that you got for your wedding or you bought at Home Depot because it was on sale? You probably don't need every knife that's in that block. I guarantee there's at least one shape you're not gonna use. For a lot of people, that's a boning knife. Uh, you see this guy and you have no idea what to use it for, so you kind of just don't use it or you use it for weird jobs that it's not really designed for. In my home, a boning knife is something that gets a lot of use, but it's not necessarily for everybody. You might want to add a boning knife to your collection if you want to learn some new skills. You're an adventurous cook, you want to branch out a little bit. Uh, these guys are really great for cleaning sinew off of roasts and trimming stuff up, but they're also really great when you're working around bones. They tend to be a little more durable than the average Japanese knife. And often they use steels that are a bit less hard, so they're less likely to chip if they run into a bone accidentally. I would use this guy if you wanna buy those whole tenderloins at Costco and trim them yourself. Uh, you can use it as a fillet knife for fish if you live somewhere with fresh fish. They can be really great, but you don't need to add them to your collection if you're not somebody that likes to take apart their own pieces of meat. 
If you do like home butchery, however, or you want to learn about it, another great option can be a Hanasuki. This is a Japanese poultry knife. We've got a lot of great videos showing how they work on our channel, but essentially they are the Japanese version of a boning knife. You've got a thick heel back here, so the knife can be made from harder steel, and this section can still work around some bones and cartilage. You've got a slimmer, razor sharp tip for that really precise work. And so while you can't chop through bones of this guy, you can work around bones carefully, and it can handle that kind of work really, really well. I also like the swept up belly. When I'm taking a chicken breast off of a chicken, I like to do these kind of sweeping, gentle cuts, and it's really, really great for that. Again, going back to trimming up roasts and that sort of thing, these knives are great for that, and you can even fillet fish with them. So it's a, a great option if you're thinking about getting into some, maybe not whole animal butchery, but more small scale stuff. Speaking of bones, Japanese knives are terrible for cutting bones. The worst, they will chip. In fact, we have some videos on our channel showing how you can chip knives on bones because it happens pretty easily. This is good for bones. This is a cleaver. This guy in particular is made in Spain. It's made from much softer steel than Japanese knives, so it won't chip nearly as easily, but it's also a much thicker blade. You've got a lot more steel in behind the edge. And so when you whack into a chicken bone or even something bigger like a pork rib, it's not gonna chip, it's just gonna go straight through with very little effort. That also means you don't have to swing it as hard because the weight does more of the work, so you're not getting dangerous, right? You're not bringing the knife up behind your head like that uh, to get a full swing on it. I use this guy at home, again, when I do my own kind of home butchery and I need to take that chicken carcass down into smaller pieces to make stock, this guy does a great job at it. Now let's get into some slightly weirder kind of fun knives. These are ones that average home cook isn't gonna use. I don't think my mom's gonna use any of these knives, but if you like collecting knives or you just like things because they're cool, these are gonna be pretty awesome for you. First up, we got a Mega Guto. This guy uh, is, I think, a 270 or 300 millimeter Guto. Why do you need a knife this big? Because it's awesome. You can cut up watermelons. You can also just show off and do finely minced garlic with it. I find, having bigger hands, I need at least a 240 millimeter Guto. And even a knife this big, this like ping pong paddle of a knife, can be really great for just like daily prep, if I have a lot to do. Uh, you know, I'm doing a big batch of something, doing meal prep for the whole week, and I'm cutting up like five pounds of vegetables. This guy's gonna do a great job. Sure, it's not for everybody, but it's pretty fun, it's pretty cool, and if you're gonna have a dinner party where you wanna show off to your guests, get out your biggest, craziest knife, and then let your guests try slicing a tomato with it so you can blow their minds. Uh, next up, we have some Bunka and Kiritsuke tip knives. Uh, you'll actually see these a fair bit. They're pretty popular alternatives to the, uh, the Gyuto that I mentioned earlier, or the Santoku. The Kiritsuke started off as a variation on a sushi knife, uh, and I actually made a video on that. You can watch that if you want to learn more. The Bunka was actually invented before the Santoku, but nowadays it's often thought of as sort of a, an alternate option, like a different skin for a Bunka. I really like the look of this shape. It's got a slightly more precise tip maybe than a, than a Santoku. Not much differences outside of that, but if you just want a really rock star look a knife and it's gonna live up on your wall in a magnet, go for something cool looking like this. You'll also get Kiritsuke tip petties, where you have this really angular kind of, I don't know, almost like sword tip look. And you'll also get what's called a double bevel Kiritsuke. And it's very similar to a Guto, but sometimes it's got a flatter edge and it does have that really angled tip to it. Earlier in the video, I mentioned how the kind of food you like to cook is really gonna dictate your choice of knives. If you're a carnivore, you're probably gonna want a sujihiki and a boning knife. If you're a vegetarian, you might want a nakiri. If you like to do a lot of Chinese style cooking, you might want a chukabocho, also known as a Chinese cleaver. This guy bears some similarities to the nakiri. Do you notice the main difference? It's a lot bigger. This isn't even like a big chukabocho. This is like a small to medium chukabocho. Despite looking like a meat cleaver, it's often a very thin, precise blade. There's actually different grades of Chinese cleaver and they vary from very, very thin to super thick for doing like hard bones. The reason we call this a chukabocho and not a Chinese cleaver is because this is made in Japan to a Chinese style. There's a different name if it is a Chinese made chef's knife. The benefit of a, a tall blade, much like the 240 or 270 Guto, is there's a lot of versatility if you understand how to handle it. So for example, big blade, really great for big things. I can use this knife to thinly shave cabbage for coleslaw and look, the cleaver doesn't get lost in the actual vegetable that I'm cutting. 
really, really great for big things. However, they can also do precise work. Say I got 20 pounds of mushrooms I need to thinly slice. If you know how to handle this guy, you can blast through them in no time. Because of the weight of the knife, it's gonna do a lot of the work on its own. And if you get used to just letting it drop, it's actually gonna tire your hand out less. Look at this. See, I'm not actually pushing the knife down at any point. I'm just lifting it up and then letting it go. It takes a bit of practice to learn and get good with that technique, but it's worth the practice if you wanna learn how to use one of these knives. You can also do really fine stuff like garlic. Uh, the heavy, thick blade is really great for smashing cloves of garlic. Because the spine of the knife's a bit thicker, you don't need to be as afraid of bending the knife as you do with some of the finer Japanese knives. Finally, you've got a curved edge. It's subtle, but it's there. And so unlike the Nakiri, you can actually use the Chukabocho to rock through and finely mince your garlic. Remember, if you're doing this, don't scrape your knife. That's a bad sound. If you need to move things across your board, just lift it off the board slightly. If you don't hear anything, you're good to go. You can also flip the knife over and use the spine. And with this guy, what I love is I can actually use the tip of the knife to move things across the cutting board. You can scrape that tip all day and you're never gonna damage it. The last few shapes we're gonna talk about are more specialized, more traditional styles of Japanese knives. These are called single bevel knives. And in regular English, what that means is they're sharpened on one side. Your average kitchen knife is sharpened on one side and the other side. This guy isn't. This guy has a, a bevel where it's sharpened on one side there and the back edge of the knife is kind of flat, it's actually slightly concave. So what you get is sort of half of the angle. Now the knife's also a lot thicker, so they tend to carry a lot more weight, but you get a really sharp, precise edge. It's a very traditional way of making a Japanese knife. There's three main shapes that you're gonna wanna think about. The average home cook never needs to own one of these. But if you're a collector, you like to have unusual shapes and challenge yourself by learning how to use them and make different kinds of food, they are really cool and I've had a lot of fun with them. First up is the Deba. This guy is a fish butchering knife. It's got a really thick spine and is pretty thick on the heel so you can get into fish bones and finer stuff and uh, really crunch through them without chipping the blade. The tip, much sharper and is really good for working in along the bones and removing the flesh from the fish. That single edge is crazy sharp and so you, you don't tear the flesh of the fish, you just get a really nice clean cut. Personally, I prefer using a Deba to fillet a fish uh, compared to a flexible boning knife. And you can actually see a video where I compared the two. This is a new Suba. This is basically a single bevel Nakiri. Because the blade's so thick, it really struggles if you're ever cutting through really dense vegetables like potatoes, because the blade's actually gonna wanna go in towards the flat edge a little bit. But it's really good for uh, katsuramuki, which is a uh, style of peeling with a, a usuba. You can get really long, thin pieces of daikon radish that are just like see-through sheets of paper. It's really cool, and you can cut really fine garnishes with them. Lastly, we have a yanagiba. This is a long, slender knife, a lot like the Tsujihiki, uh, but is specially designed for slicing sashimi. And so you get these really nice long cuts. Again, using a long blade to slice uh, raw or cooked meat is gonna give you a better end result. And if you're dealing with something really delicate, like raw fish that's got a short shelf life, you're trying to reduce its exposure to oxygen, having a really sharp, smooth cut is gonna create less surface area and actually preserve the flavor of the fish better. Now you can use this somewhat interchangeably like a sujihiki, but I find it really struggles with denser things. That's where single bevel knives tend to have more trouble. So if you're slicing into a beef roast that's uh, cooked a little more through, uh, this knife is probably gonna have a hard time and again, it's gonna tend to go off one way. So you're not gonna get super even thicknesses of cuts. It would probably struggle for portioning steaks for the same reason. That said, when I carve up cooked meat, I tend to like thicker pieces. I personally think it's a crime punishable by death to cut your roasts and your steaks paper thin because then all the juices come out and uh, it just doesn't taste the same. You just have a plate full of flavor that you didn't get to eat. So if you are cutting thicker pieces of cooked meat, the Yanagiba can be really, really nice for that. It's just not great for those really thin deli meat slices that you might want if you made your own bacon, for example. So I know that was a lot to take in, but now you hopefully understand what 
every single shape of knife is for. If you're on the website or you're going into your local knife store, you can navigate a little better and determine what size and shape you're gonna need. The staff there should also know that, and it's their job to help you determine what's gonna suit your needs. Do you need 17 different kitchen knives? Probably not. You might fall in love with handmade Japanese knives and decide you want one of everything. It's happened to a lot of us, and that's why we have so many people working in knifeware. But to recap, start with three knives, even two. Something medium-sized, Gyuto or Santoku, something small to do the little jobs, and then think about getting something longer pretty soon if you're gonna be getting into roasts, loaves of bread with your bread knife, all that sort of thing. If I were to build a slightly more complete set that would probably do everything forever, I would probably say five or six knives is the cap for the average home kitchen. I would probably have these, uh, Petty, Nakiri, 210 or 240 millimeter Gyuto, a Hanasuki, alternatively a boning knife. You probably don't need both. Sujihiki and a bread knife. And then maybe a cleaver. All right, seven knives, <laughs> right? But again, not everybody's gonna need all those knives. If you're a vegetarian, you don't need these two. If you're a celiac, you probably don't need this one. Uh, if you hate vegetables, you probably don't need a Nakiri. Just think about what you like to cook, what you like to eat, uh, what your culture is, how much you wanna expand your culinary palate, or if you just wanna stick to what you know, and, and let that inform your choices. If you ever need help finding a knife, just visit your local knife or store, or uh, shoot us a message on our website. Somebody will live chat with you and we'll help you find the right knife. Or leave us a comment below. I check them every day, and I'll be happy to help you find the right knife or knives for your kitchen. If you wanna learn more about kitchen knives, Check out this next video. Knives, buy them. But wait, how many kitchen knives do you actually need? I was channeling Vsauce. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. Everybody poops. I made delicious Korean barbecue one time. I marinated a, a pork shoulder, a couple of pork shoulder blade steaks and a nice, uh, uh, I think it was a, like beef skirt steak or something. Grilled them perfectly, and we are gonna slice them up and have them with lettuce wraps. And I forgot like one thing, so I had to run to the corner store, and I asked my buddy, who's a chef, Nate, to slice it up for me, and he sliced them so thin that we just had a, a just, oh, so disappointed. I like thick chunks of meat that have chew and texture to them, uh, and, and I guess he sees the world differently. Take me down to the garlic city where the night trip and bells are smelly.